Hello, everybody. Um, very excited to be with you here today. Very esteemed panel. I think this is the big, is this the biggest panel of the whole? Yes. So I will try to uh, wrangle everyone and get everyone uh, a chance here to speak. So this is the intersection of media and sports betting. And I think that is obviously the place to start. These days, it does feel like more of a collision, though, and not much of an intersection, kind of like what we see out there in Times Square. Um, and Brian, I think a great place to start, senior gaming analyst over at Bloomberg. You get a perch and you get to watch all of these collisions take place between operators, media companies. But from what we talked about prior to the session and what you'd like to address today, private equity has a big kind of talking point here, especially Apollo's deal with Yahoo, which kind of is setting the tone for this. What are you seeing there and how is that going to affect the rest of the space? You know, it really is fascinating. I just left the um, other presentation where the BetMGM Investor Day was going on, and one of the executives mentions uh, the relationship both with Sports Grid and with uh, Yahoo. And there are so many moving parts that come into question. For example, when Apollo takes a major stake um, in, um, in Yahoo uh, from Verizon, uh, and I think it raises a lot of questions for me as an analyst in terms of what the long-term strategy is. I spent a lot of my time looking at relationships between casino operators, um, online sports betting operators, and media entities. And we're starting to see you know, these multiple arrangements where I'm very curious to see, and we have some great expertise on this panel, to get some insight as to how uh, this all plays out. Do, do these operators choose a preferred uh, media distribution uh, partner, or are there or room for such multiple partnerships? Well, you mentioned Sports Grid. We have the CEO of Sports Grid here, Adam Kaplan. Adam, I, I think originally Sports Grid had a very strong partnership with Fandle, now MGM. It does seem like the partnerships between networks and actual operators is kind of the soup du jour. Do you want to explain what your current situation is with MGM and where you see that going forward? Yeah, so Sports Grid, for those who don't know, is the 24 7 sports betting network. Uh, with strong, vast distribution across OTT, streaming, connected device, radio, linear, uh, et cetera, platforms. For us, what we've been able to do is really accumulate a large audience of sports bettors on tele, you know, tuning in mostly on televisions and mobile devices. Um, and so what that brings to the table in you know, 2020, we had roughly 52 million across um, those platforms, and this year we're on pace for closer to 70. Those are 70 million unique sports bettors in the U.S., and really operators don't have many places they can go to get that kind of targeting um, on a national scale. And so what we've been able to do, we've worked with FanDuel, as Jared knows, uh, since 2018, and have been a part of their rise. Um, I was over on the FanDuel side then. Now I switched over to, to be uh, at SportsGrid, and I'm very happy about doing that. Ultimately, what we are doing now is working with more operators. And so you mentioned, and sounds like uh, our good friend Matt Prevost mentioned, Sports Grid on the GM Investor Day. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is be the sports betting network that works with multiple operators and um, you know, the place to go for the sports betting enthusiasts that uh, is looking to consume content in almost like a CNBC-like format. So for us, Really having the distribution, and I think what operators care about, you know, is picking up on multiple different pockets of audience to try to reach and engage those customers and get them into their, uh, their orbit so that they can cross-sell them everywhere. Um, and Sports Grid historically, is a pretty good way to do that. David Facillo. Yeah, um, I, so I'm with uh, SB Nation, part of Vox Media. Um, I've had a sports betting content, and I just wanted to kind of follow up on what Adam said. We're kind of in a slightly opposite position where, you know, you're appealing to the, to the sports better immediately. We've got, you know, a loyal reader base that not, you know, isn't necessarily into sports betting or has not engaged in it regularly. And so our goal is to figure out what we can do with that. Uh, we have a partnership with DraftKings um, as our exclusive sportsbook partner. And so kind of using that partnership to see, you know, can we, you know, how do we convert users? That's, you know, the, the big white whale of media is figuring out how to convert users. And so we're using this partnership to really figure that out. But again, it's starting with an engaged base, but not engaged in the traditional sports betting sense. So it's, it, it's a work in progress. Kelly Prack, CEO of Envenue, um, on the business side, 
micro markets and actually targeting specific sports betters, sports fans, and then trying to convert them into sports betters. That seems to be a big growth market. How do you do that? Yeah, so um, for those of you who don't know InVenue, we're new on, new on the scene. Uh, where we've gotten our uh, growth is in real-time predictive analytics for the next play. So right now we're on Apple TV. So if you watch Apple TV baseball, we're the, the numbers on the bottom right. And why this is important is we're seeing huge engagement from, from the fans now that we're putting it into a number that they can recognize. And they're, they're challenging the numbers. They're excited about the numbers. And I think that's the next growth into getting fans to start to bet in the moment. And as a sports fan myself, that's what I want to do. I want to bet in the moment and what I'm watching. And so this collision of betting and watching is, is coming and we're getting ready for it. It's tough because we see a lot of integration with odds on the screen that are actually happening. I've watched some of the Apple TV broadcasts. It's helpful. Instead of saying Aaron Judge to, hit an R to get an RBI plus 200, it says 33%, which to me, that allows the average fan that isn't into sports betting to kind of understand that a little bit more. Uh, Martina Ackerlin, CEO of Triggy, for you, it's live betting. And we talked about this, the difference between the US and Europe right now is live betting. 70% of the handle in Europe comes from live betting, half of that here in the States. Is that a gap that can be bridged by something that you can suggest? Uh, well, we think so. Uh, and, and actually here, I think it's like 30% in the US that is live betting mm. and, and in Europe, like around 70%. Uh, and of course, uh, for you who doesn't know Triggy, uh, we're working with bet engagement tools. And to us, it's all about personalization to, to engage in play. Uh, and that is where we feel that making it like... Um, uh, engaging and, and for the fan to be able to, to place a bet uh, and also as a fan nowadays or, or to all of us as consumer we are used to uh, being addressed by personalized messages we're used to uh, Facebook to Netflix Amazon and others so we think it's extremely important to, to engage, but also work with personalization. So you feel like, okay, I, I'm, I'm really into this game. I want to place a bet and I want to do it in play now uh, to, to make it convenient and entertaining. Yeah, live betting, uh, we used to do a show. We still do. The Sports Grid still does a show that is specifically geared towards live betting. That is a massive growth audience. Brian, to me, we talk about media ESPN has to fit into this category in some capacity. Where do you see ESPN? Is it licensing? Is it more content? Is it, are they going to link up with the operators and actually get the content specifically? To, where do you see ESPN, which is Disney, Behemoth, yep. fitting into all this? The ESPN story is, is, is fascinating because we've watched this um, where news and speculation started emerging that ESPN might seek a licensing partner. Mm. And so the big question we ask, or I ask as an analyst is, who might that be? You know, the, the one logical angle of this, which is interesting, is you know, you've got the, um, uh, the uh, ESPN studio uh, run out of the link, which is owned by Caesars. So one might think there's a connection between ESPN and Caesars, and yet Caesars has invested enormous capital into William Hill for this very successful and massive launch in the US. So we've tried to, look at the puzzle pieces and figure out where ESPN belongs. It seems like it's a logical um, dance partner, if you will, for somebody. Um, but you know, Caesar's angle seems less plausible to me as an analyst, given all the investment in William Hill. Um, you've got other companies like Wynn, which have tried to get in the business, but have really scaled back in customer acquisition costs. So um, ESPN seems like a logical uh, entity to find a sports bet licensing partner. And yet, a lot of the dance partners have been taken. I'm sure there's a, I'm sure there's an opportunity out there. But you know, some of the more obvious ones, users that come to mind, would seem somewhat less obvious given all the other investments they've made. Mm. So it's a it's it's a puzzle where uh, maybe some of the operating people here have a better sense of it. But as a public market analyst, it's a puzzle we we've tried to unravel. Well, Adam, you've worked on both sides, media and operator. Is there, a better, is, is there a winning side to this argument, or do both sides need to win in order to get the product and get the most out of what is gambling revenue that's sitting out there in these states? Yeah, I mean, look, running a sportsbook is, has its challenges. I mean, for the most part, a relatively low-margin business that appeals to a large number of people. And a lot of the juice 
for operators can come out of cross-selling uh, those customers between different verticals that they have. That's where it comes from. And so you know, I think um, you know, ESPN, which was brought up, you know, has a, a very large footprint. Obviously, they're the worldwide leader in sports. You would imagine anything they do is going to be big if they do anything in the gaming space. And so, you know, Brian, I'll leave it to the market analysts to speculate. But I think this concept of media companies trying to become gaming companies, gaming companies trying to become media companies, what it really comes back to is, do you want to build inside out or do you want to build outside in? To date, the most successful models in the US have been inside out builds like FanDuel and DraftKings, or even MGM and Caesars, who have big brands, big databases, you know, in the case of FanDuel and DraftKings, digital expertise, serving real money products to gaming partners in the US. In the case of you know, MGM and Caesars, you know, they've had to develop in those areas through, well, you know, in Caesars case, the William Hill acquisition, and MGM's case, the deal with Entain. Um, but they had those, those brands and they had that uh, resorts database to work from and the, the sort of footprint and foundation. Um, and so, you know, where we haven't seen as much success are, is sort of in the category of media companies trying to go outside in um, and become gaming companies because of some of the challenges. And so I think ultimately that's, it really just comes back to what your strategy is. Um, but I think the the ones that are having the most success kind of know what they're good at and partner up with others that have what they don't have. It seems easy for a gaming company these days to become a media company. I turn on my TV and all I see is DraftKings ads and FanDuel ads and the marketing that they're able to pump into these respective states. It's almost, for lack of a better word, nauseating at a time. David, are, are these companies now that are trying to get brand awareness? We want you to bet with us. It's cool to bet with us, are they doing more harm than good in the long term as this industry continues to develop and mature? I don't. It's it's hard to tell right now, just because it is you know it's the wild west where everybody's try, you know just desperate to get you know get that customer base. Um, and you see new you know new companies coming in. You saw Tipico when they you know signed a deal with USA or with Gannett, and they're coming in well after everybody else. You know I. I think you're, there's a point of diminishing returns in terms of how people like react negatively to seeing all these ads because at some point now everybody's seen these ads. Well, almost everybody. My wife does not see these ads because she's not a sports fan. <laughs> and it's fascinating though that like you've kind of reached this point where I don't know that it can get worse because you re they really can't advertise any more than they are already. I mean, I don't want to give you know I don't want to challenge them, but um, I don't Be think. Be careful. That, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so I don't I don't know that it's really necessarily going to get worse. I think they're going to try and pivot. You know, whether they're trying to you know follow the the bar stool brand of not directly, but more in the idea of like being a lifestyle brand because you've seen you know DraftKings and FanDuel getting in and getting into NFTs and getting into these other areas that are sports betting adjacent or just you know not entirely related to it, but they want to really. Build, they want to build a brand that's more than sports betting, which makes sense. And you're seeing it with, you know, DraftKings Casino and that eventually, you know, that I suspect that's going to be their major investment, you know, in the future. But um, it feels like they just want to, they want you to know about them, but they don't want you, you know, they want to kind of spread that, you know, how do you know about them? Hmm. Kelly, it does seem like uh, targeting who the casual fan is and getting them into the space seems to be the biggest challenge right now. How do we solve that? Yeah, so some of the some of the marketing and some of the advertising, I don't feel like it's it's looking at the casual fan. It's looking at somebody who's already a traditional sports better, right? But the people who are watching, um, they're largely casual fans. Like to be honest, um, it's people who are non-traditional sports betters, and so you have to look at what. And by the way, that's me. That classifies me. I I watch sports. I'm an avid fan. I love numbers but I'm not your traditional sports better. So how do you get somebody like me to bet? How do you get my mom to bet or my kids um, who are over, <laughs> over age, by the way, they, they, they can bet. Um, how, do you, how do you do that? You, you look at what they want to do. And what we want to do is we want to watch the game that we love. We want to get involved in that moment. And um, we want to be able to challenge it. Like some of the things on Apple TV, people will, people will challenge us and say, there's no way that, that the RBI probability should have dropped that much. And it's like, that's a betting moment. Like, you think you know more? Like, come in and bet. And so the personalization of the bet needs to happen. Uh, you need to recognize that not everybody is your standard sports better. So I think that advertisement is, uh, in, in a sense, it's off. 
because it doesn't speak to me um, and, and others, many others that are like me. So once we can know what the fans want and reach them, and by the way, that's micro markets. That's in the moment. Will Jose Altuve hit this home run right now? Um, I'm an Astros fan. Sorry for all of you guys that are not. Um, what's that? You're mic'd up. Uh, yep, I am mic'd up. <laughs> they are surveilling this, uh, this, this conference today. If I had a nickel for every time I thought the sports book was wrong about a line, um, I probably would have a much different job today. Uh, Martina, I, I think the key, especially in the U.S., is the infancy of the market. Mm. You've had a chance to experience European markets. My, my, uh, uh, the company that I work for, Spotlight Sports Group, has done an incredible job of building a, a European betting content brand, trying to do it now here in the States with PixWise. What is the challenges when you see what Europe went through and now you're seeing what the U.S. is going through in the early stages? Are there similarities? Is there a correlation? Are we deviating from what was successful in Europe? Well, I think this is the, the most interesting thing to, to follow right now. And that's why it's so extremely important to like measure everything and, and work with data in a really like thorough way, uh, because it's easy to jump into cl conclusions. But also, of course, the markets are, are different from each other. There are many similarities, uh, but also many differences. Uh, and, and I think to be su successful going forward, you always have to, to, uh, to really look into the data and, and what the numbers tell you. Uh, so focus on that, and it will be interesting to follow the development. Uh, Brian, I think consolidation is inevitable. Um, but when we talked on our call last week, you felt big tech, Apple, Google, Meta, Amazon, you're kind of bearish on them really investing in the space and becoming a major player. Why? And is there a chance that that might change in the future? So I think that that's certainly part of the potential landscape where I'm most intrigued by maybe in the near term, and maybe it's a bit near term thinking is, you know, the media companies themselves, aside from pure tech companies, are looking for ways to get involved. You know, most notably, you know, Sinclair had a, a network of regional sports networks, teamed up with Bowie's to create a Bowie sports book, and Bowie's acquired networks to get some technology. And then, you know, Fubo TV is interesting too, uh, another media entity with kind of a, a rabid sports fan following. You know, launching launching a sports book. So I certainly think it's possible that you know big tech could get involved, but even um, the other media entities. You know, there are still major media companies trying to find a way to make make this work. Whether whether it's Fubo TV or or Sinclair, uh, or we mentioned before ESPN. There's certainly room for tech to get involved, but you know the media entities themselves are trying to sort all this out. And when I think about consolidation too, I'm curious to hear, you know, Dave's perspective on SB Nation because you know there's another thing as an analyst I'm trying to unravel, where we've got DraftKings um, with with SB Nation forming DraftKings Nation, then you've got Vison, which Wayne Kimmel talked about before, uh, kind of integrating its contact into DraftKings Nation, but we don't exactly as an outsider know how. So I think even before we get to you know, potential role for big tech. There's a lot of moving parts that still have to be resolved in terms of how these relationships pan out. Feel free to chime in there. Oh, yeah. It's, it's been an interesting relationship. Um, I've been working with DraftKings now for about three years. Um, and in that time, they bought these in. They invested in Metal Arc. Um, they're doing, you know, deal after deal after deal. And we've been working with with them and Vizen to try and figure out the best ways. Because again, Vizen, for, for those that aren't aware, is a subscription-based service. And so, and DraftKings Nation is free content. And so we've kind of, you know, started to pivot a little bit towards what we can do with, with Vizen uh, around some of their content to help promote it. But also, um, so DraftKings Nation is on the same platform as all the SB Nation sites as The Ringer, Chicago Sun-Times. Those are all on the same um, digital or content management system. And I think one thought is, well, do we, you know, do, do we try and move some, you know, a site over to that? Because we have, so Vox has New York Magazine, which is subscription-based. So there, you know, we've, there's a lot of different ways to approach it that we're just trying to figure out what makes the most sense, what would work, and what will, you know, benefit each of the brands. But also, I think the biggest thing that we're, we're trying to figure out and, and we've been thinking about for the past year is how do we promote Vizen? Because they are, Vizen, kind of to your point about where, you know, what DraftKings is trying to appeal to you know, they've talked publicly about not about appealing to that recreational better. That's, you know, controversially enough, they've, they've talked about that. And Vizen is not the recreational better. And so I, it's interesting to see how they want to integrate that and try and figure out, because again, we're partners with them, but we're still an outside company. So we kind of have to sort of like see what they're doing and try and figure it out on our own as well and just kind of follow the context clues. 
Speaking of recreational betters, when we talk about the casual better, that's another word for them. The media companies now seem to be a lot more singular with their focus. For example, FanDuel has Pat McAfee. So much of their resources is pumped into promoting him. And he puts out a bet on FanDuel. Everyone bet with me. It, there's been some controversies about the influencer going out there, working for an operator, and saying, bet with me. That is kind of a three-card money on the street kind of deal. Uh, Adam, you've had experience with this on both sides. Do you see a conflict of interest with media companies pairing with just huge influencers with millions and millions of followers just changing the course of a specific betting market by putting a specific bet out there and then inviting the public to quote unquote bet with them? I don't see a conflict, mostly because of how, I, I mean, at least in the case of Pat McAfee, um, how the deal is structured. So when we were doing the McAfee deal at FanDuel, the big sort of priority was we wanted him to be able to be authentic with his audience because, you know, with these influencers, the key thing is really the strength of the relationship they have with their audience. So in the case of Pat, Pat's paid cash, right? And there are obviously, you know, benefits to him engaging his audience and getting them excited about bets. Um, and from the operator standpoint, you know, if you're not paying your person based on revenue, right, or performance to that end, then there's really no conflict. And even if they win, when they do, you know, whatever the bet is, I think he had one the other week that won, you know, pretty well um, with a pretty big following, that's just part of beating the flywheel, right, and getting, you know, money flowing through uh, to your customers. Because ultimately, really, you know, at a certain point, the real challenge starts to shift as there is consolidation and maybe we move towards a world where there aren't 20 books in, in uh, New Jersey and there's more like seven to 10, the real battle is going to be about share of wallet. It's not going to be about customer acquisition, right? Mm -hmm. And so you really want to be able to have these always on opportunities for your customers to be able to engage with the personalities, teams, leagues they love uh, in a way that continues to feed the flywheel. MGM's deal with Leo Vegas is interesting. Martina, it's, it, it expands them into Europe. It's a massive deal. MGM just reported they have 25% in global gaming revenue here in the States. That is a huge piece of the pie, and now they are expanding to Europe. What is, are they starting to build the model of what a successful operator will be in the States? Well, I think that this is what we see right now, like the, the, the big brands uh, buying really good tech uh, and, of course, American brands buying European tech that has done this for, for quite a while. Uh, that, that's a good combination. And, of course, uh, buying Leo Vegas, that's, that's both tech, but also the markets uh, and the knowledge that they have. So it's, it's a great combination. And I think, see, think we will see more of that going forward. Brian, anything to add on the MGM Leo Vegas deal before we wrap things up here? This is really interesting. And one of one of the with all the focus on sports betting, one one of the places where BetMGM has been really successful is actually the iCasino product. Yeah. And um, just in terms of market share leadership, and uh, granted, it's limited to some five states or so, but with somewhat lower promotional levels than is the case for sports betting, they've managed to actually build out you know quite a solid market share. And with all the frenzy about sports betting, I think sometimes US I casino, again, constrained to a few different jurisdictions, doesn't get the uh, attention. But you know, certainly uh, companies like BetMGM and Golden Nugget Online and the search for live dealer capabilities, that's a real opportunity. I am curious to see if they can parlay that and extend that uh, to Europe with the uh, Rio Vegas deal. Great gambling term there. Use parlay. It gets, a, parlay yeah. <laughs> gets, the, gets the dollar for the day. John from Sencor has a question. Thank you, John. And I, I think, Kelly, this is best for you to answer uh, with our short time here. Um, how does the intersection of betting data and odds merge on the screen? How do you see that playing out in the future with especially what we're seeing with Apple TV? Well, we, have, we have two options, right? Uh, the first is uh, move to more casual betting and always call it probabilities which people tend to get or train the people that are watching to understand odds i i don't know what the odds of success of that are but um <laughs> but I, I do think that um i do think that we've just got to make it more casual and understandable um and by the way like 
we will bet, you know, so we will bet when we, when we see these and when we understand it and it's welcoming and when it's in the moment and when it's real time, like all of those, all of those factors have to, have to be there. We have to be watching it, see it, engaged with it. It's got to be the right bet. Uh, there's, there's so many things that we, we need to do and we need good tech that will do that. And that's, that's what we plan to do. Yeah. I think if we've seen the numbers in New York, people will bet. Uh, that is not an issue. Uh, under a minute to go, I, I, should we you know, concede the rest of the time back to the floor? I can't see us doing much else in the last 45 seconds. So thank you all very much. I appreciate uh, your time today.